I show up with a with a boom box and I'm gonna start playing old country songs. <laughs> it couldn't have got weirder. Yeah, the, the jokes so, are so there. just because you're crying on the phone to me, they're not. Those tears aren't that valuable. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear Kanye West singing flower shops, but I have. <laughs> Being an Opry Next Stage artist. Bragger. Nobody likes a bragger. <laughs> Nobody likes a bragger. Hey, easy. But uh, it's it's actually, it's it's really cool. And, and the program itself of just providing a little bit of an extra spotlight to a group of people that they deign uh, worthy. And I, it's an honor because it's given me uh, access to play the Opry a couple more times and do Opry things, have this conversation with you. Um, and and if anything, maybe there's maybe there's one of these nights where I'm out there playing and there's a kid like me out there that that's his epiphany. Mm -hmm. and, and it it changes the course of his life like the Opry did for me, for sure. Um, and so to have to have a group of people um, that are going to get to go through this journey together and, and see where we are. If this is our, if it's like our class, you know, if whatever our class is. Oh yeah. Um, it's going to be cool to look up in 30 or 40 years and, and see where we're standing and knowing that it all started kind of here with this, with this um, getting tagged like a, like a prospect if we're athletes, you know, <laughs> get the recruits, if you will. <laughs> well, I can tell you as, as, an, as an older dude, um, not knowing how it's going to turn out is awesome. Yeah, you know, if you yeah. if you knew how the book was in was going to end, you'd probably never read it. Yeah, you know, and that's the way I've always kind of experienced my life. I said, I'm just going to answer the phone. Yeah, and I don't ever know who's going to call. Yeah. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. What, you know, what did Yogi Berra say? If you get to a fork in the road, take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but that's exactly it. You know, I try to be. I try to be what all those people have been had had been for me. Yes. Thirty five years ago, when I was out there, Will Jimmy would be on the side of the stage, Porter would be on the side of the stage, and Bill Monroe would be out there, and, and the camaraderie that went on. And now, I've learned from that, and I try to be that, you know, in in whatever way. If somebody's out there making their first appearance, I'm always over there on the side saying, "Hey, welcome." That's so cool. You know, and look forward to having you back and. Because they all, it, it's so simple because they all did that for me. Yeah. You know? Well, the pay, the pay it forward thing is, uh, I look forward to do that. I want to be that for somebody and, and several people. Um, and overall, just super grateful that the Grand Ole Opry exists. Yeah. And uh, whatever little piece I am right now, I'm, I'm happy to be there. There's a, speaking of pedal still, Russ Hicks. Yeah. Okay. His daughter played basketball for my dad at Lipscomb. And when I was just getting into, I think I'd gotten a banjo for Christmas, my third grade year or whatever. And I was really into bluegrass and like flattened scrugs and all that. And Russ saw me take an interest and he was like, come with me to the Grand Ole Opry. Well, and well. so my first experience at the Grand Ole Opry was doing the backstage thing and watching her. So I remember the catering room and, standing side stage um, and like during set changes or something, he was like, come out and stand. I got to stand on the circle at, and as a 10 year old boy. Yeah. And uh, I remember looking at looking at the Opry House and just like, it sounds so cliche, but I really was like, I want to do this. Yeah. And then the next time I stood in the circle was my debut 20 years later. That's awesome. Yeah. I knew Russ. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, my, my story of the first time getting to play there is, is pretty hysterical. I had always dreamed of it, you know, like anybody that plays and sings a little bit of country music, that's the that's the mecca, you know. And So I'd, I'd moved here in 83. I actually played the Opry stage, but not as an Opry show. Bill Monroe did a, a thing every, thing every year during the DJ convention or something, and the band I was in got to play on a show that Bill did on the on the Opry stage. That would have been 1975. And uh, then all these years later, I moved to Nashville in 83. And I'd get invited with friends, say, hey, come out and sing harmony with me. And I said, man, with all due respect, the first time I play that stage, I'd really like it to be as me, mm -hmm. you know, selfishly. And That's fair. And uh, so 
a bunch of years had gone by and I never had the opportunity. And then uh, my young, my oldest daughter, Jenny, was uh, going to be in the first grade talent show um, at, at uh, Grassland Elementary School in Franklin. And she said, hey, I want to be in the talent show. Will you teach me a song? I said, of course. So I taught her, you are my sunshine. Mm. And we practiced and practiced and went to all the rehearsals. And, and uh, so the, the, the talent show was on that Saturday night. And uh, Tal Durham was the general manager at the time. And he called and he said, we've been watching your career. And we kind of like what you do. And we'd like to invite you to play the opera. And I said, man, I've dreamed of this call my whole life. I said, when? And he said, well, Saturday night. Obviously. And I said, yeah. this Saturday night? And he, he said, yeah. I said, man. I wish I could make it, but I'm booked at the Grassland Elementary School. (laughs) 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 And and so, good dad dad move, right? So, they invited me, you know, sometime later, and I got to go out there and play. And then the cool thing was when Jenny got married, we were trying to figure out what would be a good father daughter dance song, you know? You are my sunshine. Gotta be. Gotta be. That's great. Yeah, but it's. It's a it's a special place, you know, because I played some bluegrass and you had an interest in it too. The history of that place really goes back to more of that string band music yep. than, than country music in, in per se. The first opera show they ever did was a fiddler named Jimmy Thompson. This went in a hotel room down in downtown Nashville and played uh, played fiddle tunes for a while and, and that was the first ever broadcast of the opera. It wasn't even called the opera then, but yeah. Um, and then what was what was really unique about it was WSM was an insurance company and it it, the, it, st- it stood for We Shield Millions, and the whole purpose of them putting music on the radio was they were trying to a- appeal to rural people to sell them insurance. Yeah, it's wow. Not, you know, it wasn't so much about this purity of country. Yeah, 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 all yeah. That. It was still a little bit of business. Yeah, in there, sure, you know? sure. So what do they like? They said, well, they like that fiddle and banjo stuff. You know, so that's why. Well, it kind of started the way it did, but you know, it's almost a hundred years old now. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, yeah. I I've always um, put the Opry on a pedestal since maybe and maybe since before that night, but definitely since that night. And I've always aimed at um, getting to play that stage. And when I got that phone call too, you know, when Flower Shops was was a moment, mm-hmm. um, I'm I just was kind of shocked and. A tear rolled down my face. All the, all the all those feelings happened, and um, it was like a warm pat on the back that I wasn't crazy for trying, trying. to still make country country music, and there's yeah. a home for it. Yeah. Yeah, I found that so many of my relationship that relationships out there with people like Little Jimmy Dickens and Porter, and, and you know, and we watched them all on TV when we were kids, me and my dad, and so much of that is is out of my father's love and mother's love for for this music and and uh, I didn't know a whole lot of this stuff but I'll tell you a great story about little Jimmy Dickens great Christmas lights by the way oh, little, yeah. Jimmy, little Jimmy Dickens every <laughs> exactly. year yeah uh, and uh, he was around and and uh, I remember one weekend uh, me and my dad used to sing the bird of paradise all the time when I was a little boy so one night I, Jimmy and I got to be good friends and I said can I come out and sing harmony with you on on, uh, on Bird of Paradise, he said, "Sure, kid." You know, I went out. And my old man called the next day, and he said, "Well, you finally made it. You sang Bird of Paradise with Tater mm. on the Opry, and that was a pretty neat moment." But anyway, my dad came and to see me at the Opry one weekend, and he really wanted to meet Jimmy. And I said, "Well, yeah, sure, we'll do that." And went down and introduced my dad to little Jimmy Dickens, and um, he said, "Asked Jimmy, he said, do you know where I could find a copy?" of Country Boy, plain old Country Boy, your, one of your hits, and Jimmy said, he said, I can't find it anywhere. He said, Jimmy said, well, give me your address and I'll just send you one. So he sent him a, a, a copy of Country Boy, you know, and I paid attention to all this, and I didn't know why, but um, anyway, uh, fast forward a few years later, my father passes, and, and uh, it was just such a, you know what kind of show. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, because I was popular, I was going through a divorce, my father died, and we're all up there, and the cameras are everywhere trying to yeah. get this and get that, and it was a real mess. And uh, so, my dad's girlfriend at the time had to 
have a Catholic presence at the service, you know? And I said, well, okay, mm -hmm. you know, do whatever you need to do. And the guy in the big hat that comes out and shakes the smoke and does all this <laughs> stuff. And then I show up with a, with a boom box and I'm gonna start playing old country stuff. <laughs> it couldn't have got weird. Yeah, the, the jokes right. so, <laughs> so I pushed play and played plain old country boy. And my dad's brother was there. And after I played country boy, I said, well, my father's brother's here. He'd kind of come out and talk about my dad and this and that. And he was, his eyes were like, and he said to me, he said, why, why did you play that song? I said, well, I, you know, just, I knew, I knew dad liked it. And da, 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 he said, no, you don't understand. When we were little boys, that's the first record we ever got wow. as kids. And so there's all that stuff that's, wow. it's all in there, a part of it. And that's why I love it so much is I love the reverence that I have for all those that came before me and try to keep that alive. And Amen. I keep my dressing room, dressing room door open like Mr. Acuff did. And we were out there one night and Acuff always kept his dressing room door. Everybody was welcome and people would come in. We'd have jam sessions and it was just the best hang. And mm. he'd tell stories and whatnot. One guy came in one time and asked him for his autograph. And, sure, I'll sign that for you. And he signed it. The guy said to him, he said, boy, I bet you wish you had a dollar for every one of those you signed. He goes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and back to it. That's good. But it's just a, you know, there's a there's a spirit out there that you can't explain. Mm -hmm. And it's it's hip. It's cooler. It's hipper. It's more meaningful than all your hit songs. It's mm -hmm. it's it's different than just the music. And I just adore those people out there. Yeah. Special place, special feeling. And, you know, uh, I, I owe a lot to my grandparents, too, because they put me on hee-haw as a young kid. So I I had a little bit of a, I got to skip a little bit of a generation in what I was consuming. Sure. Uh, yeah. Grew up a little older than I was. Um, and obviously grew up on you and when it comes to singing and harmonies and stuff. I mean, harmonies... My mom's not much of a singer, but she had me singing harmonies to the Chuck Wagon Gang, and like cool. you know, like that was like I was ten years old uh -huh. singing harmonies to all that. Um, yeah, man, I think also being a Nashville native, maybe not being in the shadow of the Grand Ole Opry, but it always being around and and getting to represent Nashville truly through yeah. the Opry. It's really rare to find a native hmm. of Nashville in this business. You know, Amy's yeah. a Nashville native. My wife Amy and you and it just doesn't it doesn't happen very often. This yeah. is more of a, a transient place where people go to and travel to and, and, and all of that, you know. I did, most everybody I know. Where are you from? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Don't hold it against me. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> did you know Hag? Did you know Haggard? Mm -hmm. I sang on I got to sing harmony with him on some of his very last recordings. Man. And I'll tell you a good Haggard story. Please. Um, I was telling you about Jimmy and, and, and when my dad passed. Oh. Anyway, after that, there was a guitar player that played with Jimmy named Jabbo Arrington. And he had a great old broadcaster Fender guitar with the first year that they made Fender solid body guitars from 1950. And they're really sought, out, sought after. And, and uh, anyway, this guy played with Jimmy. He was his first lead guitar player named Jabbo. And his family contacted me and said, we see you play a guitar like our relative Jabbo played with Jimmy. Would you be interested in buying it? And I said, absolutely. You know, so they came to the Opry and and uh, and I bought I bought that guitar from them. And and when I bought it, they said our real dream is to see it played on the Opry one more time. And I said, well, I can make that happen. I think. And I went to Jimmy and I said, hey, can I come play with you? And he said, I've come. I said, well, I just bought Jabbo's guitar. And he said, I want that guitar. <laughs> And I told him what I paid for it, and he goes, I don't, I don't want, want that, that talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that talk. <laughs> and so, so I went out and played with him. The family's over there all crying. It was beautiful and a uh, really neat moment. And then when Jimmy passed, you know, they asked me to come sing Go Rest High. And I said, well, I know what I got to do. So I took Jabbo's guitar out there and played Go Rest High at his service. And mm -hmm. told everybody, I said, what you don't know is this guitar was owned by a man named Jabbo who played with Jimmy when he first came here. So I thought the guitar that brought him here ought to be the guitar that takes him out of here. God. You know, this killer story, killer moment, everything. And, you know, it's it's just a beautiful moment. I get home and the phone rings and it's Haggard. You know, he said, hey, son, it's Merle. I said, yes, sir. And he said, I can't, I can't believe what I just saw. I said, that might be the greatest thing I've ever seen, what you just did. He said, I, I love that man. I love Jimmy so much. And 
what you just did. He says, I can't quit crying. He says, I don't cry. Hmm. You understand me? Hmm. I don't cry. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and he just said, I, I, it was so neat, you know, because I, I really adored him. And he said, I want that guitar. I said, well, you can't have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just because just cause you're crying on the phone to me. <laughs> They're not, those tears aren't that valuable. <laughs> But, uh, you know, me and Paul getting to do that record oh. while he was still alive and, and uh, tribute to him and Buck and Bakersfield. And That's right, yeah. He, he wrote the light liner notes on that record. Haggard did? Uh -huh. And he was my he was my number one. He was, people say, who's your favorite artist of all time? I always say Merle. We listened to so much. I was telling you about Chandler. We listened to so much Merle Haggard on our bus mm -hmm. before shows. Everybody's listening to everything else, and we were like, it's, we might as well have a jukebox on our bus. The music we listen to all Good. day, every day. It haggard, man. It was, you know, it was unbelievable. I, I have, and tell me what you think. This is my, my own brain working, but I think the reason he wrote the songs the way he did is because he had his freedom taken away from him, and he was actually in prison, mm -hmm. not just, you know, talking about what it might have been like, but he actually experienced it. How long him, was he in prison for? I don't think a long time. And, you know, and, and you think about a song like, you know, I turned 21 in prison doing life without parole. Yeah. That's about as sad as it gets. Yeah. But then comes the hope. No yeah. one could steer me right, but mama tried. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what, the, the, to me, is what, if you lose hope, then you're done. You know? Yeah. But even in the greatest of despair, if there's hope in there somewhere, it's, it's kind of beautiful. You yeah. Know? My song, Go Rest High on That Mountain, is as sad as it gets, but... Hope. really is hopeful. Go rest you know? on a mountain. Yeah. 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 That's um, that song. But That's the Way Love Goes is probably my favorite Haggard really? song. I, that's my day. I daily listen to that one. Daily listen to that. Misery and Jen, beautiful. Right. God. Yeah, it was fun. When we, me and Paul did that record, and I was going, which song should I do? And we didn't, we didn't do the obvious ones, really, I don't think. And it kind of made it fun, you know. Yeah. We did what was suitable for some good guitar playing and some great steel playing and yeah the way we went steel guitar might be my favorite instrument it's mine by a mile yeah there's nothing it, like it uh -uh. i think it's because it emulates the human voice yes as closely as anything can you can you can have a duet with a steel mm. guitar it's exactly what it is yeah. yeah when i was uh i mean i watched i watched every country music show that was on tv back when i was a kid they weren't on when you were a kid, but they're in, in syndication or something. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was <laughs> watching reruns, but I was watching them. <laughs> they were live when I was there. But we watched Buck, we watched Porter, yeah. we watched, you know, everything there was. And, and I was just always infatuated with steel guitars. And then when I was 18, I'd moved to Louisville, Kentucky to play in a bluegrass band. As soon as I moved there, they wanted to make a record. So we came down here and uh, made a record, and they got Buddy Emmons to play on it. And it was 1975, and he was absolutely torching it. You know, he always did. But mm. uh, and it just it lit a fire in me that never went away. Yeah. You know, I've always had to have uh, that that element of of that instrument in my music. I loved it. You know, Paul. Do you know Paul very yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gotten to over the last yeah. couple of years playing on my records. I'll tell you a great story about Paul. Was this was 1989, and I was cutting when I call your name, and the steel guitar was not in in great favor probably in, in that era. And most people didn't want it on their records. And if they did, they wanted it to not sound like a steel kind of guitar, pad, yeah, the yeah, string yeah. pad, the do whatever. And and Paul had played the solo and when I call your name and I called him up and I said, hey man, I, I said, I'm sorry to bother you, but I think I could talk you into coming back down here and replaying that solo on when I call your name. And he said, well, I like what I played. And I said, well, I do too, but I said, I don't mean to offend, but I want the instrument to cry. I want the instrument to do what it always used to do to me. And and, and, and he was he wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> and he came down and and he just played one of those, you know, those life changing steel guitar solos. Yeah, There's right. a handful of them in, yeah. in the history of this music and and uh, the song went on to do what it did. Oh, what a song. He put, pulled me aside and he said he said, I know it wasn't very nice to you when you asked me to replay that, but I'm really grateful that you mm -hmm. asked me to replay it, you know. Special. Yeah, it is. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it, 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 there's been a history, I think, in our music where we've run from it. 
Oh, sure. You know? Yeah, and I, I'm very thankful that it's it's coming back a little bit right now. Yeah. I mean, God, if I got anything to do with it, there's still guitar <laughs> soaked all over my record. Yeah, baby. So if, if there's one, it's I'm going to do it. <laughs> I just feel, and, and you know, uh, to bring it back to the Opry and playing at the Opry, there's all kinds of, I got all kinds of songs across the board. Sure. But there are certain songs that I'll probably never play at the Opry because I want, I want the Opry, there's, there's, when I'm cutting my record, and you, Paul will tell you too, we run it through an Opry filter. It's like, well, this, what is this going to sound like yeah. with the Opry band? And I think, I think those, I think there needs to be steel guitar in those songs. And yeah. I got more fiddle on this next record than I've ever put in. Mm -hmm. I just, I want country music to make people feel how I felt as a kid mm -hmm. when I got addicted to it. Well, that's the way it works, you know. Yeah. You, you, you turn people on to what you loved, and that's, yeah. that's how history works. It's, it's, you know, you can't expect a, a kid your age to, to know all the history of this music, but if there's people in between that go, hey, if you like this, look at this, and mm -hmm. then this, and this, and then you go down those rabbit holes and find, you know, all these great musicians, all these great songs. And it's just, it's a blast, you know? Yeah. What, there was, um, what was the little round circle y'all used to? There's a great video of you and George. Was it, Hag was it Haggard oh, too? Uh, what is that? It was, uh, George had a TV show for a minute. Okay. And and everybody sat around and Because I think y'all did He Stopped Longer Every Day. Yeah, I was playing guitar yeah, that's for right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it was Man. pretty magical. Um, the Grand Tour is another one of those songs that gets me every time. Is there a theory on that song? Do you have a theory on that song? I don't know. All, all I know is... It's sad um, as shit, is what it's, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, I think Nora Wilson wrote that song. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. And I may be mistaken. I usually am. But I wrote a song that was all over it one time. And I got to listen to it. And I go, oh, shoot. I, I wrote the Grand Tour with different lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> I called him up. Yeah. I called Nora up. And I said, dude, I said, I no, no ill intention there. But I think I, I'm all over your song. And he goes, ah, don't worry about it, kid. Oh. You know, it's pretty cool. That's yeah. a good way to be about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man. Step right up. I've heard myself sing that now on a AI, and it's it's, -uh. it's pretty creepy. Oh, <laughs> AI is funny, man. It's a trip. It is funny. <laughs> yeah, I never thought I'd hear Kanye West singing "Flower Shops," but I have. <laughs> <laughs> but I That's have. great. Oh yeah. man. Well, you know the Opry has a a million great songwriters that have come through those ranks and I like to play I it's a it's always a delicate balance you know because you want to you know Roy Akef voice you say you better sing the one that brung you your son you mm -hmm. know go better in a, and so you always want to sing something that's familiar to people because a lot of times it's people's first experience sure, as right. an audience member to see see the see the opera but the reason I do it I, I play new songs out there all the time maybe a couple of new ones and a couple of old ones and Everybody walks away happy, but when I first played the opera, like I told you back when my kid was little and they invited me and I couldn't make it and finally did, well, When I Call Your Name was a new song and it hadn't been recorded yet. Mm -hmm. And that's the first song I played. That's incredible. On the opera. You know, so it's 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 got a history of, of good luck. I'd say. To me, you know. I was born at the opera. And, yeah. Much, yeah. And so I've always, always felt like it was a neat place. And I, I, I have it, I, I like... Like you, I, I'm respectful of. I don't ever play electric out there very much because I don't. I'm not, it's not conducive the way the band sets up and mm -hmm. the way it sounds out there, where it's where it's very satisfying. So I always play, always play more acoustic and play more traditional driven and let Tommy shine and yes and uh, all of that. So uh, how about you? Yes. Yeah, do, so do you play new songs out there? Uh, I probably will. I mean, the, I've played it three times, and I played the ones that brought me there. <laughs> but but um, I will say, in the story of Flower Shops, uh, the first time I ever played that was at the Ryman at, for the it was like Whiskey Jam ten year reunion gotcha. or something like that, or anniversary, and um, that song hadn't been out. I hadn't even recorded that song yet, and I just knew if I was it was my first time playing the Ryman stage, mm -hmm. and I was like. 
I think I have to play this song, just me and my guitar. Yep. And uh, that that feeling inside of me, and I wasn't wrong. Yeah. That my label was like, why don't you play one that's out? I'm like, because it because it's not going to be the same at the Ryman. I'm at, this is the <laughs> I'm playing at the Ryman. I'm going to play a country song on an acoustic guitar, and you're going to like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, but I think that um, songwriting and has it affected. It has 100% affected my songwriting in in that I run it through that filter in my head. I can hear what it would sound like at the Opry, and, and one of my favorite compliments is when the Opry bands fired up about like, exactly. when, when they're like, Man, yeah, you, that's this nice stuff's song. cool. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's like the Opry band compliment gets me fired up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those guys they you know, hear so, it all. They hear it all, mm -hmm. and when they when they decided they're going to be in the Opry band, they probably want to play country songs, you know? Exactly. And, and it's cool that when they're fired up to play something that you like, we all agree. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a long history out there of, of a lot of artists bringing their own bands out there. Mm. And I never did that much. I always wanted to use those guys, you know? Mm. And even, gosh, all those years ago, 30, 35 years ago, Guys like Buddy Harmon were still around and playing, and and if if you'd never played a shuffle with Buddy Harmon, he's kind of the guy that invented the groove, right? You know, and so that was always, I knew if Buddy was there and the band was there, I was going to play a shuffle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, because I knew how great it was going to feel. So, and I like I like I like the upright bass more than electric bass on the Opry because oh, it sounds great on the radio. Yes. You know, I'm always thinking about wow, how it's going to sound on the radio. Yeah, Things I haven't like thought that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right though. Yeah. yeah, and 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 so, you know, I, I think that a lot of people don't want to use a house band because they have their band that they tour with. They really know their stuff. But um, it, my guys might get the boot next time I play the <laughs> because I, great. I always have Grady on the drums, and I let Chandler play steel, yeah. and I have a guitar player, and the rest is Opry band. But um, sorry, guys, I might go full <laughs> full bred Opry band no, next time. It's kind of fun, but it's it's also. You know that's that's how they get paid. Yeah, is by the spot out there. Yeah. You know if they don't get to play on on the show, they don't make any money. So I'm always thinking about them. That's a great point. Of, as, uh, as far as that, and uh, a lot of people would bring their touring band, and they didn't even really tour that much. Yeah. You know, and they'd have them out there, and it would always cut the staff band guys out of a chance to get paid for a spot and this yeah. and that. So I always ask them, so what? Do you guys want to go home tonight, or do you want to play? And they. Sometimes they'll say, we, we're tired. Yeah, yeah. Can you handle it? Yeah, I'll just yeah. be in the guitar and yeah. whatever. But yeah. How many times do you reckon you've played the opera? I don't know. Ain't no telling. I never, I wouldn't even know. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I counted it back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, I always showed up. You know, I was grateful that they asked me to be a member 30 something years ago. And, and you know, with all honesty, what I've noticed is my generation of um, the artists that have been made members are pretty pretty scarce they don't show up a lot mm -hmm. and i think it's my place you know i remember acuff told me one time i was in his dressing room and he says you know back when i was really hot and everything was i was killing it and all that he said they came to me the hollywood came and wanted me to make motion pictures and i don't know if it was cowboy movies or whatever but because he was so famous you know mm -hmm. um and he said, I, t I told him no. I said, I knew the opera needed me. God. And he, he turned it all, all that, that, that down, and he was a staple. Jamie Johnson uh, had me backstage when I was there last time, and um, he said something I'll never forget. He was like, we do the Grand Ole Opry because it's it's not what they're going to do for us. It's it's what we can do for the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. And, and I'm like... Yeah, dude. It's, yeah. It's, and you get more out of that than anything. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you're a part of this this long line of rope and you get to put your own little knot in it is yeah. it, that's uh yeah, you know, pray ye I would love to one day have be a member of the Grand Ole Opry. That you know, everything childhood me, all the mm. support my parents showed me by just getting me instruments. They weren't musically inclined at all. But they took me to shows. They got me instruments, and not many things can say they've lasted a hundred years, and they can. Right, that's pretty cool. Yeah, the the uh, another another great Opry moment that blew my mind was 
uh, Dean Dillon asked me to come sing. We have a song together on my record, and he was like, Ernest, I'd like you to come sing this song with me. I'm doing that. He goes, they've been asking me to do it for years, and I'm gonna, I'm said yes, but I want you to come sing this song. And I was like, okay, no problem. Uh, hell yes, I'll be there, right? <laughs> and uh, I go in the green room, and Jesse Joe, the whole family's in there, and I was like, oh, this, yeah, I guess it is a big deal. Dean's doing the opera. He goes, this is my debut. I was like, this is your Grand Ole Opry <laughs> debut? <laughs> He's like, I've played this stage one other time in my life doing like a George Jones or a Hank Williams tribute like mm. 40 years ago. And he's, he's something. He, he played, what he played? He said, uh, he had Bill Anderson come out and they did, I'd done a lot of things different. Yeah. Then Dean played the chair. Yep. And then I came out and played a song nobody knew with Dean Dallin Dillon for his third song. That's like, great. couldn't we have done that one first? And then he's such a hoot. He is something else. I've gotten to write a few songs with Dean over the years, and we've written this song. Oh, it's been 15 years ago now, whatever. And it was this really beautiful story song about a. Um, it's called Whippoorwill River. It was about him and his dad used to go fishing on this Whippoorwill River, and and then. The, his son had a son, and and the granddad takes him fishing down the da 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 da. And we used to go, my ride in my granddad's canoe, and it's just, it's just this beautiful, beautiful song, you know, and like only Dean could be a part of. We finished it, and I asked Dean, I said, I said, was your life anything like this? He said, Oh hell, I didn't even meet my dad for like 38 years. <laughs> And see, back to this storytelling. You can make up a whole thing. Uh, <laughs> fall in love with man. This guy and his dad had a better relationship than any father son I ever knew in my life. He's like, oh, I didn't meet him. Tell me, didn't meet my dad when I was 38 years old. <laughs> I, I had this other song I'd written with him. Uh, it was called A Letter to My Mama. And we had it titled something else, and we wrote it 30 years ago, you know. And, and my sweet friend Don Sears heard that song. She goes, why have you not recorded that song for your mother? I said, I don't know, just never made it on a record or fit or whatever. And she goes, well, promise me you'll record that song someday. She passed away, Don did. And, and so the next record I made, I said, I got to do that song for, yeah. for my mom. My mom's the same age as the Opry. She was born in the fall of 1925. So that's a, wow. another reason there's a really yeah, neat, connection. deep connection, you know. And, and so I, uh, <laughs> I recorded it and I changed the name from whatever we had it called before, and called a letter to, we changed it to a letter to my mama. And I called Dean, I said, hey man, I'm gonna record that song we wrote 30 years ago. Do you care if I change the name? He goes, I don't even remember that we wrote that hey, song. Hey. Change whatever you want. Dude, the family element of, of the opera is, yeah. is really cool. And you know, that's, I've gotten to meet you and talk to you through yeah, that too. And I mean, that's, and it is what I, I treasure it more than and having hit songs and being out there and all of that, it's really the people I've met, you know, the friends I've made, and it's its awesome. You know, yeah. people, until they go out there and experience, you know, like, like I told you earlier, so many artists that, of my generation that don't go out there and play, and go, you have no idea what you're missing, mm -hmm. you know? You know, the people you're gonna meet, and just the best, you know? And the, the fans, like you're saying, it's a lot of people's first experience, and that, mm -hmm. you know, we're so, used to going out and having rowdy crowds standing up and s singing every word to the songs mm -hmm. loud and um the they're really there watching a show and taking it in and, and so and it's a total different environment if you go out there thinking it's going to be like going and playing your regular place. bonnaroo yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah it's just not it's, i know because you that's the only to me it's the only place you can go and see maybe 60 years of musical history in mm. one night. Mm. Easily, most people go to a concert and they see one or two people. Mm -hmm. You know, with them, there's 12, 15 acts. Yeah, on Ghost every. Riders in the Sky, uh -huh. and all the way down to somebody's brand new debut. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Somebody's yeah. been there 60 years and somebody's been there six hours. It's great. Yeah. Well, he's written more hit songs than I have. <laughs> wrong, big wrong. <laughs> 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 Yeah, tell me something I don't know, please. Please tell me something I need to know. I'm sure I can. Sing better. I definitely <laughs> sing. I, man, I don't know. I, you could, though. I think you already did. Um, it's, and it's a good thing to remember when writing songs. Uh, minimal. And say as much as you can without saying too much is great advice. Yeah, that's what Guy Clark taught me. He said, if, if the word that you're using doesn't add to telling the stories, it doesn't, it doesn't belong. Yeah. 
you know, and, and being a musician and being a singer, I mean, I, you have to understand I write songs also from a musician's perspective and a, mu uh, uh, a singer's perspective in that sometimes certain words won't sing good. Correct. You know, and I need, I need one less syllable. I need three more syllables. It's all about finding the words that, that uh, feel the best, feel right with the melody and, right. and, and all of that. And which word are you going to lean on to, to, to sing? And um, man, I, you know, I have a, I've got a really interesting history with songwriting in my own head and in my own heart because for such a long time that was that was the knock on me was I couldn't write songs. Really? Oh yeah. And you know those early 80s years I struggled to ever have a hit, you know. And I I wanted to be a songwriter, you know, my heroes were songwriters. Hmm. And I wanted to be an artist that wrote his own songs and and that was the last thing that showed up for me was writing songs and you know, I think my singing and my playing always kind of overshadowed my songs. And um, so there was even a period where I was told by my record company that I couldn't record my own songs. And that was pretty, that was pretty crushing. Yeah, I'm sure. You know? And so I've always had enough of that to keep me in a place where you don't think you're, don't think you're Roger Miller, don't think you're, you know, Right. Bill Anderson, whatever, and, and I just kept at it and kept at it, and, and little by little they got better, and I think they got better because of my willingness to be patient, sure, and my willingness to to uh, to edit myself. Mm. When you're young, it's really hard to edit yourself. I remember I was playing on a session, you know, and that's what I you know, I aspired to be a session musician, play on people's records, sing harmony on records, and that's what I wound up doing. I've worked on. Well over a thousand artists' records in my 45, 50 years of doing this. I want this. you to play on my record. Right. Play, play some stuff on my record, please. All right. <laughs> I'll play steel. You know, I was a steel player. Really? <laughs> Vince Steel playing steel. I was horrible. Steel. That was horrible. <laughs> Vince Steel. We, we sold it and we called it a mercy selling. <laughs> okay. So it wasn't any good. But, you know, I just, I think, and here's what's beautiful, you know, that keeps me going is my songs are better today than they ever were over the last 40 plus years. Hmm. And you, you don't see it on, on, the, on the way up, but what's gonna happen down the road is, you know, maybe the world won't notice, maybe you won't have hits anymore, maybe you won't uh, ring the bell like, like you are in your, in, your, in your hot stretch and all that, but if you know it's better, then that's enough. Mm -hmm. Hey man, that's great. Yeah, and God, I'm, I feel like where I'm at right now, I am, I'm in a, do not get complacent just because it's a hot streak right yeah. now. And, and I don't think I'll ever be able to stop right. It's not like I turn it on, turn it off. I get dry. I don't write for a few mm -hmm. weeks at a time. Sure. Um, I think a good idea is like an egg toss, right? You gotta, you gotta let it, you can't go out and just try to make it yeah. happen. Um, and the editing, the self edits is, is hard to do I think in this day and time with how quick turnarounds are with demos and all, you know, you write yeah. with the track guy, get yeah. it down, turn it in onto the next one. And people like to forget it ever happened tomorrow. Well, yeah. I mean, um, and that's, that's the, the state of the world is the information is yeah massive. Overload. coming at you. you didn't, you didn't have to wait, you didn't have to wait two years for your next artist famous best record. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. And you were always anxious and, and willing to, to, uh, get to take in new stuff, you know. And there wasn't as much of it. The information age is yeah. mind-numbing to me, you know. But um, I just think that what I had what I had going for me was the realization that even in those years that I struggled and I wasn't having hits and I was I wasn't I wasn't discouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, and even when I go back I told you about how they didn't want me to record my songs. If I'm honest with myself and I go look at those songs, I go, I don't blame them. Sure. They were right, yeah. you know, and that's fair. And um, so sometimes, sometimes criticism can, can be beneficial. Sure. You know, yeah. I remember first record I ever made was uh, a producer was a guy named Emory Gordy who's married to Patty Loveless and a great player and played with Elvis and uh, played with Rodney and me and Roseanne, all of us, we were great mates. And, and I'm in there singing this really traditional country song and he hits the talk back and he goes, dude, uh, let me tell you something. He said, we already have a George Jones. Mm -hmm. He said, 
and you're not him. <laughs> yeah. were, you do, were you doing? Were you doing your best, I was, George? I, I just was singing like I, you know, yeah, no, the old licks. And yeah, he says, "Dude, you just got to sing like you." Yeah, he says it's the only way you're gonna ever. Well, that worked. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it you know, worked. It, but but that's that's the that's the great thing if you're if you're not too headstrong and whatever to be coachable. Yeah. Yeah. You know.